1.3 million die annually in the states uh, about 157 so it's it's about 10 percent of all of the deaths while uh, America constitutes less than two, maybe less than three percent of the general population. So that means that uh, uh, Americans die of cancer of the lungs three times more than the rest of the of the world. It is a major, major problem, uh, and uh, it is one of the most preventable cancers there there are. As uh, we will uh, talk a little bit later. Of course, now we have uh, much better diagnostic tools. Uh, for cancer, and this is a CAT scan, and we can see the tumor very easily uh, here. In 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 this case, much newer patient from us, and we can see this view come uh, up up down or, or uh, front to uh, to back. The typical symptoms of uh, cancer of the lung is shortness of breath. Why? Because uh, a tumor like this may compress on, on airways and, and obviously it's going to restrict the amount of air going into the lungs and the amount of uh, oxygenated blood that goes through the system so the heart is going to work more and shortness of breath is one of the main uh, symptoms. Another one would be coughing because uh, a, an irritation or a blockage tends to form a lot more mucus in that blocked area and the patients will begin to cough, including uh, uh, blood in, in, in the production, in a productive uh, cough. Weight loss is another one because these tumors tend to consume a lot of energy uh, from the patients and uh, even though patients may continue eating uh, normally, they tend to lose weight because of the heavy um, calorie consumption due to the tumor growth. And about 10% of the patients virtually have no diagnosis whatsoever. And the patient that I showed you before, like this one, uh, this tumor was found just on, on a routine uh, chest x-ray. This is quite a large tumor, and this patient had no symptoms whatsoever. This one, though, had uh, severe symptoms, all of the symptoms. One of the complications that a patient like this will have is that easily this patient will develop pneumonias, infections of the uh, bronchi, and uh, that sometimes make the diagnosis a little bit more complicated. There are many types of lung cancers, but the two main ones that we have are the typical small uh, cell lung cancer uh, that happens in about 17 percent of all cases diagnosed of cancer are, are of this type, and they tend to be quite aggressive and uh, uh, they appear in the periphery of the tumor, uh, usually in the parenchyma of the, of the lung, that is in the lung tissue itself, whereas most cancers, the non-small cell carcinoma, 80% of them begin in the bronchi actually, in, it, they begin actually uh, inside of the airways, and that's called, they, they were also called in the past bronchogenic because they were generated in the bronchi rather than in the lung uh, tissue. We also, uh, so you see that 97 percent of the tumors are uh, from these two. Uh, there's a very small percentage of carcinoids, a different type of tumor, and also sarcomas you may find of, of the lung, and uh, they have uh, different prognosis and uh, different ways of uh, treatment, but uh, fortunately they're not very common. Now, uh, of course, we have uh, PET scans and uh, different type of uh, studies where we can much better see uh, tumor activity even uh, in colors as, as you see in this one, a very large primary tumor of the lung here with a satellite already within the same lung. And uh, once we have a satellite on, on the tumor, it's not considered a primary or it is a primary tumor of the lung but not uh, stage one or two, it's already stage three because it has another satellite within the tumor. And the more tumor activity, obviously, the less uh, the, uh, the possibility for survival. So survival varies depending on tumor activity, whether it's in stage one, two, three, or four. And the overall five-year survival rate for all persons diagnosed with lung cancer is about 14 percent. 
it's extremely low in comparison to other cancers. And the reason for this is that we diagnose most of the cancers of the lung in late stages, three or four. And as you can see here, the five-year survival rate for stage four cancer of the lung is less than 1% with uh, conventional treatments. And as you will see later on, our statistics are much better than that. And so there's a lot more hope for cancer uh, patients suffering stage four cancer of the lung with us than in um, probably any other institution in, in the world. The reason why I mentioned that uh, this is one of the cancers that we could really uh, diminish and make an impact is that it is very, very related or extremely related to smoking. So cigarette smoke contains over 60 known carcinogens. I'll just mention the four more common ones. Uh, ra radioisotopes from radon, uh, nitrosamine, benzopyrene, and nicotine. Now the problem, biggest problem with nicotine, not only is that it is a carcinogen, it, that is a cancer-causing cancer agent, it also is an immune suppressive agent. So this one-two punch is uh, uh, too devastating for a patient and that's why smoking increases the possibility of you developing cancer many, many fold uh, uh, in comparison to those that do not smoke. So deaths related to smoking around the world, 91% 90, of lung cancer deaths in men are directly related to smoking. So just by not smoking, we could reduce the number one cause of death in the world. For 71% of all deaths of women with cancer of the lung is completely related to this uh, uh, bad habit. In the States, overall, 87% of all lung cancers are related to smoking, 90% in men, and 85% were much higher than in the rest of the world. And one of the reasons is that in America, most women will go through hormone replacement therapy. So a woman that smokes and has hormone repl replacement therapy has 60% more chances of dying of lung cancer than a woman that has never taken hormone replacement therapy. And so these are facts that I think are important for you. If you are smoking and taking HRT, I would invite you to stop that immediately and uh, uh, give this information to uh, the young women in your family so that they stop smoking as soon as possible. I will make a break right now and allow um, Gaston to talk a little bit about our results and our statistics in comparison to other centers in, 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 in the U.S. and also in comparison to the conventional therapies against cancer uh, of the lung. Here's Gaston. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Contreras for that great introduction to lung cancer. Uh, before we continue on the treatment types that we offer here at the Ways of Hope, I want to talk to you a little bit about the cancer survival statistics that we have here at the Ways of Hope. We, the Ways of Hope began a study about five years ago in hopes of measuring the survival rates of our patients who receive treatment for breast, ovarian, lung, and colorectal cancers. Since most of the cancer patients who come to the Ways of Hope have advanced metastatic diseases when they get here, we have restricted this analysis to patients who, who, have, who, who were diagnosed in stage 4 cancer. And we compared these results objectively with other treatment centers like the Cancer Treatment Centers of America and the SEER monograph of 2007, which, is, which, is, um, which the statistics are, are given to us by the National Cancer Institute. Um, as you can see here in advanced stage cancer, the OASA HOPE has a large advantage in the first five years of cancer survival statistics. We're 28% higher in the first year and it goes all the way up to 25 percentage of points higher than the SEER monograph in the fifth year. If you see Cancer Dream Centers of America doesn't even have the fourth or fifth year available because they cannot, they, they have not given us those, those statistics yet on their websites. We can also view, and this is the most exciting 
stat that, that, that I like on breast cancer survival statistics. If we are the first option for breast cancer in terms of treatment, we have 100% survival rate in the first year. It drops a little throughout the years, but it's a lot higher, 55 percentage points higher than the SEER monograph at five-year points. So Always Hope has fabulous results in breast cancer on the first option. Also, ovarian cancer, we have great, great survival statistics, and patients are alive and they're continuing with their lives. They have great quality of life. And you can see these statistics also at the US Hope webpage. You can read them and you can study them in more detail. Also colorectal cancers, they are amazing when it comes to the results. Cancer Dream Center of America doesn't have more than one year on the survival statistics and we have around of, uh, five or more. This, we're trying to get this study published in the medical journals in order for, for uh, the world to know what the treatment is like here at the Oasis of Hope and how patients have benefited throughout their lives and are still alive today with great quality of life. The Oasis of Hope has been around for more than 48 years now and these are only the statistics for the past five years. So we have an amazing tale on how we can help you in your lives. And coming to this, treatment, this webinar's main topic which is lung cancer. As you can see, in the first year, we have a 62% higher survival rate than any other treatment center or SEER monograph that, that was given to us by the National Cancer Institute. And the results are much higher also in the five year. They do drop significantly because lung cancer is a very difficult cancer to treat and is usually diagnosed in, the, is in, in an advanced stage. But even though we usually get patients that are in advanced stage, we can help them win and they are and they are alive today because they chose the Oasis of Hope. I want to give the mic over to Dr. Contreras again today and he's going to continue on with today's presentation. Thank you very much. Well, as you can see, uh, <clears throat> we have been very successful in treating many tumors, but uh, Definitely one of the uh, tumors that we have been extremely successful in treating is uh, advanced stage lung cancer, especially stage four. And um, Gasson mentioned to you, you know, about this very uh, dramatic drop from our first year to our fifth year. And uh, it is compared to the SEER 1.6 five-year survival rate in stage four that you can virtually not see in any of the publications. This is this is a very this is a, a very um, optimistic number. It's usually less than one percent, and uh, so we're at least nine times better than the um, than than the conventional therapies. But it is really much closer to twenty three percent. What happens is that our group. Here is a, is a small group, and uh, uh, two of our patients, uh, um, which caused this enormous drop from 23 to 9 percent, are patients that we cannot find. And Americans tend to move very easily, uh, so uh, we had to consider them as uh, patients that passed away, but um, uh, we do not have that data for sure it's possible that they are still alive and, and then our numbers would be closer to the 20 percent. But if you look at 20, at, at, at four years, we're 20 uh, times better in survival rate than um, conventional therapies. So I, I feel very uh, um, confident in telling you that we have a lot to offer for stage four cancer and I feel very proud of what our team has done over the years to obtain these incredible results. A lot of people that are looking at statistics now, you know, for the first time may say, well, you know, 9, 10, 20 percent is nothing to write home about. Believe me, it makes a tremendous difference for uh, a patient that is facing uh, death within a few months to know that the possibility for them to survive four years instead of a few months is about 20, uh, is about 20 percent. Um, so we, we are very proud of this and, and also we're not shy to show our statistics. A lot of people uh, 
you know, stop giving statistics after one year be, be, because of what we're showing here. But we feel that it is very important that we're transparent in, in, in our assessment. And we are very proud of, of, of our results. Cancer of the lung is a very difficult treatment to treat. It has been for the last 75 years. In spite of all of the advancements that we have uh, uh, made in, in molecular biology and all of the research areas on cancer, uh, in spite of all of that, patients with advanced cancer of the lung continue to die at very, very high uh, rates. And again, um, we could reduce this tremendously just by telling people uh, to stop smoking and hopefully more people will, will, will do that. I want to show you this picture because it's something that I've seen many, many times in autopsies. These are lungs after death of a person that did not smoke. Same age, somebody that has been smoking for 12 years, uh, a pack and a half a day. Look at the difference in the uh, uh, color of, of the lungs. And, and this patient also had tumors within, within the lung. So the more you smoke, the more you're going to damage your lungs. And um, uh, in many cases, the, the damage is going to be permanent. Uh, there are some cases where people have been uh, lucky not to have developed a chronic illness of the lung and stopped smoking. And in about five to ten years, the, the lungs are going to look much better than that if people stop smoking. So uh, uh, the lifetime risk of developing cancer for smokers, male smokers, is 17.2 percent and for women 11.6 percent. Look at the difference in non-smokers, 1.3 and 1.4 in women. So you increase your chances of developing uh, cancer of the lung by a thousand percent if you smoke. Um, and in fact, the only thing that has improved the statistics and the death rate of cancer of, of the lung, which is very high, as I mentioned, in the States, about more than 200,000 uh, people die every year of cancer of the lung. The only thing that has proven to reduce the death rate is the fact that so many people have stopped smoking, not advancements in treatment, uh, or um, advancements in research. And that is why more and more uh, states are banning smoking even in bars, which you know, sounds uh, like a, a stupid type of law. Um, and I believe that um, you know, everybody should make their own cho choice after having the, the information that we shouldn't have a nanny state. But <clears throat> anything that we could do to stop smoking it would reduce tremendously the appearance and the death rate of uh, cancer of, of the lung. So what is it that we do at the Oasis of Hope Hospital to improve the survival rate of so many of our patients? Well, we do a combination of therapies, and I have here the main eight therapies that we have against uh, cancer of the lung. So we do oxidative preconditioning, cytotoxic therapy, where we can use chemotherapy, radiation therapy, or natural therapies. I will show you that our best statistics are with non-toxic therapies, especially in cancer of the lung. Cell signal and transduction uh, means that we are going to use natural elements like foods and nutrients to uh, reduce the possibility of uh, tumor activity and to uh, make tumors a lot less aggressive. Uh, it is very important to do the redux, which is uh, um, the uh, oxidation and reduction for, uh, for our patients because uh, the more we manage this, the patients are going to do much better. Then on the other half of, of this sphere, we have uh, what we call uh, patient supportive therapies. The main difference is between the Oasis of Hope Hospital in comparison to, to other hospitals, even alternative hospitals, is that we are not aiming our therapies at the tumor. We are providing resources for our patients to heal themselves. It's, it's, a, it's a philosophical major difference. 
So we're going to do immune simulation uh, through spiritual and emotional support. Uh, not only that, but uh, also through diet, exercise, and a number of supplements that our patients take in this part of the therapy here. So the combination of these therapies is what has caused that dramatic improvement in survival rates in the Oasis of Hope hospitals in comparison to other uh, hospitals. So our anti-tumor therapies can be alternative or, uh, or non-aggressive, I would say, which would be nutrients and phytochemicals um, uh, uh, that are going to weaken the malignant cell or promote apoptosis. Um, in the last um, set webinar we had, we were talking about what apoptosis is. And apoptosis is a term we use scientifically for planned or designed death for our cells. Every cell in our organism has a, an expiration date where it is going to be replaced by a new one. Cancer cells do not have this. And so uh, apoptosis, uh, uh, nutrients that promote apoptosis in cancer cells are uh, elements that are going to let the cancer cell know that they have to expire. And that helps uh, tremendously. Or uh, there are therapies or natural elements that actually cause necrosis or dying of the tissue of cancer before its time, and that is what's called necrosis, and there are many therapies that do that. We can combine these with the conventional therapies um, that are going to potentialize the effects of the uh, uh, natural therapies, and uh, we can use the conventional, for instance, chemotherapy or radiation therapy in conventional dosages, or also in metronomic dosages. I'm sure that you've heard of IPT, of um, insulin potentiated therapy, where we can use a tenth of the dosage of chemotherapy of the conventional dose with very, very good effect by potentializing it with insulin and the use of the alternatives. Also, what these uh, uh, alternative uh, measures do is that they improve the tolerance of chemotherapy and radio radiation therapy, which in many times is very devastating. devastating. So uh, by combining uh, our therapies, we reduce the side effects and we protect the immune system. Chemotherapy devastates the immune system. It's one of the most frustrating things that happens to us as oncologists when we give chemotherapy, the tumor starts reducing in size tremendously, and then we cannot continue because the chemotherapy also destroyed the bone marrow of the patient, and the patient becomes uh, anemic and immune suppressed to the point that we cannot do any more chemotherapy. The other thing that these things do uh, is that they reduce resistance. Malignant cells uh, learn very quickly how the chemotherapy works, and they change their structure or mutate, and uh, then uh, the chemotherapy that used to be effective is not effective anymore. Well, many of the nutrients and phytochemicals that we use also reduce the resistance so that low activity uh, chemotherapy can continue to be used. But specifically in cancer of the uh, lung, we have uh, had tremendous experience using vitamin C as chemotherapy. And uh, the, these, uh, pro this protocol has been uh, designed based on uh, many publications from the NCI, the National Cancer Institute in the United States, and the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in the United States of America, where now they are actually reviving the use of vitamin C. You may recall that in the 70s, uh, Dr. Linus Pauling was promoting vitamin C as an anti-tumor agent, and he actually believed that the anti-oxidating power of vitamin C would destroy malignant cells, and his results were not bad, but they were uh, uh, tremendously criticized, and, and so at the, by the end of the 80s, um, vitamin C was not used anymore for the treatment of cancer. Yet, it was revived at the NIH by a doctor, uh, Mark Levin, and, and his group. And in this publication, Ki Chen from the group of Mark Levin 
called pharmacologic ascorbic acid concentrations electively kill cancer cells. So they were able to prove that vitamin C in very high dosages destroys cancer cells only and does not destroy any benign cells. And it acts as a prodrug to deliver hydrogen peroxide to tissues. So the vitamin C in the presence of oxygen uh, will produce within the tumor peroxide and that peroxide will kill malignant cells. And so the uh, accelerated peroxidant damage cannot be re, uh, re, repaired by uh, malignant cells and thus it acts virtually the same as chemotherapy and it activates apoptotic pathways that were blocked in the malignant cells. So these two actions uh, are the reason for our very, very good results. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, Ki Chen uh, published that only intravenous administration can achieve clinical toxicity to cancer cells, and we have been able to prove that in our studies. So uh, it is very important that we make sure that we are going to oxygenate tumors, and incredibly the most hypoxic tu tumors of all are the ones in the lung where all of the you know, interchange of oxygen happens. And so what we need is to produce the peroxide within the tumor. And so cancer is partially anaerobic. That was uh, already published in the 30s by Otto Warburg. And uh, uh, so we have to find ways of improving the uh, oxygenation of uh, tumors because in conjunction with vitamin C, they have a very high potential of killing that tumor. Let me just finish by showing you one patient that is in this study group that I mentioned to you with a very advanced cancer of the lung. You can see the primary tumor here with a satellite tumor here. And we started the, tumor, the, the treatment in April 2007 of, two, uh, I mean April 7 of 2005. And this patient had a prognosis of three to six months to live because he had received all the chemotherapy possible and uh, came, uh, the tumors came back. And so by, two, by June, from April to June, you can see only scar tissue here. The tumor is completely gone. This patient is alive today and is part of the study that I mentioned to you. So to this patient, it made a difference between dying in a few months and now being cured. So that's also a, a, a very viable possibility. This patient has no more tumor activity. What we see here is only scar tissue. And I stopped doing you know, the scans uh, then because uh, radiation is quite uh, carcinogenic as well. And the patient is doing just extremely well, so we're not doing any more studies. Um, just the fact that he's alive is very good to us.